uh, both in terms of testing the predictions from 1988 and generating a new set of predictions having to do with all the things we know about consciousness, which by latest count is about uh, 20, 25 major features of consciousness, obvious things uh, such as uh, EEG, uh, of uh, sleep, waking, and dreaming. Uh, but by now, of course, we know those kinds of phenomena at a much more precise level than we used to. So we're no longer in Hans Berger's time in 1929 where we can see the differences, but we don't know what they mean. Today we have a pretty good idea of what the, uh, uh, the cortical EEG, the directly measured EEG from brain, uh, means. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, in any case, the theater metaphor has now become the dynamic global workspace theory. And the reason for dynamic is that the current claim is that any piece of cortex can be the stage of the theater or the uh, spotlight on the theater that brought, or the lit area of the of this theater stage, I should rather say, uh, so that uh, so that visual consciousness is broadcast from visual cortex in the back of the head, auditory consciousness, strictly speaking, most of it is interactive and, and cross modal as well. But uh, uh, isolated auditory events are broadcast from auditory cortex uh, in sort of in the uh, in the underarm area of the temporal lobe sticking out uh, on the left and right sides. Uh, somatosensory cortex, uh, uh, the somatosensory strip, uh, which you cannot see here, but it's on either side of that notch, um, uh, is the source of uh, external uh, body feelings. Internal body feelings uh, apparently project to the insular cortex. So there's broad broadcasting from the insular cortex as well. And throughout uh, cortex, uh, there is this uh, astonishing apparent uh, uniformity. Uh, so that the, uh, in, in terms of layers um, and, the, and the cells that come out of the six layers of neocortex, uh, we seem to be looking at very similar tissue no matter where we look. Now that cannot be true completely, because visual cortex obviously yields different information from auditory cortex. But uh, to a first approximation using uh, a light microscopy, uh, it looks like it is true. As we get deeper and deeper into the system and do more physiological tests, of course, we find out the differences. The, the quick story then is that uh, these uh, orange uh, bursts represent broadcasts from that particular piece of cortex to the rest of cortex and thalamus. Uh, thalamus, at this point, I'm only going to uh, talk about as a mirror image structure for cortex. Every region of cortex has a corresponding thalamic uh, set of layers. Uh, and the, the similarity between the two is extraordinary. Uh, and the, the mapping between the two is, is a very, very important feature of this system. Uh, this is a very dynamical system because it depends upon constant resonance. So what we see in the EEG is actually the resonating uh, of this cortical thalamic or CT system. Uh, uh, Mercia Steriod, one of the great uh, explorers of this system in 2006, called it a unitary oscillatory machine, uh, which I think is a, is a very nice way of characterizing it. And of course, there are at least, uh, there, there are a number of theoretical approaches to it. Uh, obviously, we do have a specialization of function in cortex, uh, especially in the, uh, in, the motor, uh, in, the, in the motor output regions and in the sensory input regions. About two-thirds of cortex, I would guess, is uh, traditionally called uh, association cortex uh, and does not have uh, highly specific sensory or motor uh, relationships. Uh, so this is basically one way of looking at the corticothalamic system. This is a traditional uh, cartoon, basically. It's not even really a diagram. The two thalami uh, at the uh, center of the system uh, are egg-shaped uh, uh, structures 
uh, which are extraordinarily complex, so complex that even, even today they are incompletely known. Uh, the parts that we know uh, very well, uh, the auditory and the visual thalamic nuclei, uh, are very, very tiny. Uh, uh, other regions, other nuclei of thal thalamus have similar corticothalamic uh, inter uh, interactivity features. Uh, here's a nice uh, tractograph that uh, uh, looks like it, it, it looks like the uh, corpus callosum and the cingulate, uh, which are very beautiful structures uh, at this level of analysis. As you can see, there's point-to-point -point mapping between the left and the right hemispheres, which is one of the important reasons why uh, it is simply not true to say that we are left-brained or right-brained because there is a huge amount of traffic going, going back and forth between the two sides of the brain, uh, point to point, um, with, uh, let's see, uh, about 10 hertz, about 100 million, uh, about a billion uh, 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 action potentials every second uh, uh, being, being transmitted between the two hemispheres, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which indicates that uh, that the brute force approach of uh, slicing the corpus callosum and then testing out what the right side does and what the left side does, it, while it is revealing, it is by no means the whole story. Uh, this is one uh, very recent, uh, quite beautiful uh, effort to map out the major connectivities of the CT system, the corticothalamic system, uh, and uh, uh, I'm not going to go into detail. It, it contains all the major uh, regions of cortex. It also contains the thalamus, and I think this one probably even contains the uh, basal ganglia, which are more or less output uh, flow uh, from the corticothalamic system. Uh, what you will notice, however, is the extraordinary interactivity of this system. You can literally go from any point to any other point uh, following uh, one of the major highways uh, that runs through the systems. And that's the remarkable part of it. Uh, it is by far the largest uh, uh, parallel interactive uh, information processing structure uh, in the brain. And in the case of human beings, of course, we have the prefrontal cortex expanding uh, compared to other mammals, other primates. Uh, so we have just a little bit more uh, of that connectivity as well. Uh, this is the seat of consciousness as we best understand it, uh, and you can show that uh, through lesioning. You can show it through recovery function after lesioning. Uh, you can show it through, through minor interference like uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, you can show it from uh, uh, intracranial uh, brain recording, uh, you can show it from stimulation. By now we have a whole bunch of different uh, ways of stimulating the brain, kind of mind-boggling. And you can, you can stimulate the occipital cortex with DC, with direct current electricity, uh, and, and get visual flashes. Uh, so we can, we can diddle with the brain in all kinds of ways. Uh, and the, the, the mass of evidence converges on the notion that the corticothalamic system is the seat of conscious contents, I have to say. I have to emphasize contents because there are other brain stem structures that are also involved with arousal, sleep, dreaming, and so on. And of course, we have the uh, neuromodulators and so on. Uh, so this is not the entire story, but uh, for consciousness fans, uh, it is a big, big part of the story. Uh, now here's a nice... Uh, experiment on uh, global workspace theory. Uh, global workspace theory suggests that we have broadcasting from any part of the cortex to all of the rest of the cortex. Uh, and in this particular case, is a really clever experiment by Sam Duisberg um, and, um, and his colleagues in Canada, uh, which used a very simple design with little LEDs in the left side of the left field and the right side of the right field. Which, which flow to the nasal sides uh, of the retina, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, and then uh, if in the case of the left LED, uh, they end up on the same part of the right visual cortex. 
simply because of the well-known wiring. Uh, it's been known for 500 years. Uh, uh, namely the split between the left and the right half of each uh, retina. Uh, so we can predict exactly where the signal is going to end up in cortex, and once it does end up in cortex, we can use MEG, the, magne the magnetic signal from the cortex, um, and see what happens. And what happens is essentially a burst. Uh, of activity, 300 milliseconds past time zero of the stimulus, uh, and the burst comes from roughly occipital cortex, uh, or, or let's call it visual cortex. Uh, it may be uh, the temporal, uh, the temporal lobe, part of visual cortex, and we get this nice thing uh, bursting out, crossing over to the other side across the corpus callosum, and also bouncing off on the right hand. Uh, hemisphere. Uh, so this is a nice demonstration of the notion of global broadcasting. And once you start working it out, of course, you, you get all kinds of interesting complications emerging from that. Uh, for example, uh, based on the fact that uh, every single, well, almost every single connection uh, in this system is two-way. Uh, so you get not uh, signals zipping down a line, as you might expect if you're an electrical engineer, <laughs> but rather resonance occurring between these cells that reside on the periphery uh, of the cortex. Um, and, and that kind of resonance has been explored very nicely by Gerald Edelman and his colleagues. Um, it is similar to Trunoni's uh, work. Uh, Edelman calls it re-entry. Uh, Steven Grossberg has studied it also uh, and calls it adaptive resonance. Uh, I prefer the term adaptive resonance because I think it's more descriptive. Um, and basically, adaptive resonance is a kind of looping, if you will, uh, but a creative kind of looping. It's not a redundant kind of looping, which would not help in, in any particular way. Uh, it is a kind of looping that helps you, or that helps these arrays of neurons to, uh, to solve problems, essentially, including the identification of visual stimuli. Uh, here's another example um, of uh, the forward, uh, uh, forward wave coming from visual cortex uh, and uh, becoming conscious uh, around 300 milliseconds. Uh, Antti Revonsuo and his people have done this work in Finland and um, and they call the resulting uh, oscillation, uh, the, the resulting bump, uh, they call the visual awareness negativity. That seems to be a reasonably reliable result, but there are some variations. There's still a number of things to be worked out about it. But uh, uh, it's, it's quite surprising to me that uh, we have convergent evidence that uh, around 300 milliseconds after the onset of an arbitrary stimulus, we do get a, a brain signal uh, co uh, uniquely corresponding to consciousness. This is uh, a very nice uh, cranial, uh, uh, cranial uh, recording uh, study uh, done in an epileptic uh, patient who was being studied uh, for surgery. Uh, and uh, these uh, grids are frequently kept uh, implanted for several days, uh, during which time, uh, with the appropriate permissions, of course, uh, you can uh, ask the patient questions, give the patient stimuli, uh, and so on. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the task on top is hearing a word, uh, and as you might expect, uh, you're getting activation in uh, the auditory cortex, uh, in, uh, in parts of the gamma range, uh, different different uh, purples and and so on uh, correspond to different parts of the gamma range, and in the case of uh, repeating a word that's in working memory, you get the activation primarily coming from the from Broca's area, what is traditionally called Broca's area, which is the speech production area that is uh, typically um, on the left side of the brain. Uh, so that's a very interesting insight into the nature of the signaling that takes place in cortex. Um, and there's now, uh, I think, uh, rather overwhelming evidence 
uh, that uh, the cortex is constantly signaling to itself and occasionally signaling to the outside world as well. Uh, and that the kind of signaling uh, 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 mechanism uh, that's involved uh, involves uh, oscillations uh, superimposed upon other oscillations and traveling between uh, spatiotopically similar regions. So for example, there is a visuotopical, uh, all the visual uh, maps, so-called, uh, are visuotopical, meaning that they map into the visual field in front of your eyes in one way or another, sometimes with transformations. Uh, and there's another one in prefrontal cortex, so that there is a signal transmission from the posterior visual cortex to the prefrontal cortex, which is very interesting in terms of consciousness, because one of the key things about consciousness um, from, an, from a scientific point of view is that we can report the contents of consciousness. And we don't only do so verbally, uh, but we can do so by signaling, or in the case uh, of animals, we can do so in uh, using uh, matched sample methods. So an animal can essentially say, this smell is just like that smell uh, by matching it to, uh, to a sample. Uh, that means there is um, uh, high fidelity transmission uh, going on between the visual cortices uh, and something in prefrontal cortex or motor cortex that actually waves your finger and says, yes, I, th I recognize the similarity between these two stimuli. And now that's not to say that the transmission in, in the cortex is always veridical, but that under the right circumstances, the kind of things that psychophysicists have been doing to people for the last 200 years, uh, people can be extraordinarily accurate in reporting whatever comes into their visual cortex. Here's another piece of evidence that uh, uh, long distance uh, signal transmission in, in the cortex is associated with consciousness. Uh, on the left hand side you see uh, the distribution of, uh, of signals uh, showing a long distance phase locking. Phase locking is just dancing in phase uh, between one site and another site. Um, uh, that is unique f to the waking state in this particular study, uh, and it disappears in slow wave sleep, the most unconscious sl state of sleep, and in REM dreams, uh, which is a little bit surprising actually, but in any case, it does show that uh, long distance transmission is associated with waking, uh, and waking is a conscious state. Uh, interestingly, it also shows that hippocampal, cortical hippocampal uh, phase locking occurs um, uh, during the same uh, period, during the same time, during consciousness. Uh, I, I think that hippocampus is closely associated with consciousness, uh, contrary to the conventional point of view, which claims that hippocampus is only uh, a memory system. Uh, and, and Walter Freeman agrees with me, so it's got to be true. Yeah. Right, Walter? Uh, Walter is one of the great uh, biologists of all this uh, system. Um, this is repetitive. This is very interesting but irrelevant. Oh, yes. Uh, now, what happens when you take a new skill, like learning to ride a bicycle, and you become very experienced at it so that you lose consciousness uh, of the details, at least, of riding the bicycle? Uh, well, what happens in this task, which is an auditory detection task, not exactly the same thing, it's much simpler than riding a bicycle, uh, is that you get nice activation using fMRI, which is basically the metabolic activity of the cortex in those particular areas during the time that the task is novel and conscious. So on the left side, you see the fMRI of the task, uh, of the auditory detection task, uh, when it's both conscious and people have a sense that they're voluntarily responding, they're deciding whether or not to respond. Uh, after practice, all that stuff disappears so that the metabolic activity in cortex fades dramatically. Uh, now, uh, 
obviously there's a question uh, what's really happening. Uh, the only exception is the auditory cortex right there uh, itself, which remains active as you might expect. Um, uh, now, the, uh, you, can, uh, you can ask what's happening there. It's not as if the task isn't being done, right? In fact, you're riding that bicycle much better when it's automatic uh, than you were at the very beginning. So it's less conscious, but more efficient. Uh, there are at least two things going on, uh, apparently. One of them is that the signaling, the metabolic activity that's involved with active signaling in the cortex uh, has decreased, but it has been learned. And so it has been transformed into synaptic efficiencies. It's become structural rather than um, a, a metabolic, a high, a high metabolic process. Uh, the second thing that's probably happened in this kind of situation uh, is that the uh, basal ganglia have taken over some of these functions and you can't quite see the basal ganglia activity uh, in, this, uh, in this kind of cortical uh, fMRI. Uh, in any case, uh, what's interesting is that uh, if it is true that the cortex supports uh, conscious contents, uh, then it also makes sense that with habituation and automaticity, when you get used to doing a task to the point that you're hardly, hardly conscious of it anymore, uh, the cortical activity also drops, uh, which is consistent with the, the general claim. Let's see what we got. I got to show you stuff from uh, Walter's lab. Uh, this is very interesting work uh, that uses a very different approach Couple on this? Okay. Uh, Walter uses a very different approach uh, from the standard uh, Fourier analysis uh, of the EEG. Fourier decomposes a complex waveform into uh, a number of sine waves, uh, which is a very nice uh, and tremendously useful way of looking at complex signals. Uh, Walter has uh, made the case that in the case of EEG, it is very fruitful to apply Hilbert analysis which essentially uh, throws away the temporal uh, information in favor of spatial information. So, so that uh, uh, implies uh, that the cortex uh, is a spatial filter. Uh, and under those circumstances, if you do a lot of fancy mathematics and analysis and so on, uh, what you get is, is these rather beautiful uh, phase differences, phase difference uh, diagrams, in which you see a, an, an equilibrium of about 100 milliseconds in cortex, followed by a chaotic collapse uh, that lasts just a few milliseconds, I think five milliseconds maybe, uh, followed by another 100 millisecond equilibrium. Uh, now this is radically different from the standard way of analyzing cortex, but it's still very revealing. One of the things that pops out of this analysis, of course, is the significance of uh, 10 hertz. This is approximately a 10 hertz phenomenon. Uh, 10 hertz is, uh, comes down to 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is the fusion, cross-sensory fusion time or intrasensory fusion time that has been known since the 19th century. Uh, if you hear two clicks, one in each ear, and those two clicks are within 100 milliseconds of each other, you hear them as one conscious click. When, the, when they start drifting apart, you start hearing them as two separate conscious clicks, which has been used as an argument for the duration of the conscious moment. Um, uh, 10 hertz is also right next door to both alpha activity and theta activity, which vary a little bit uh, between species and also between the particular functions in cortex that they seem to assume. Uh, but both uh, alpha and theta have been considered, uh, have been suggested to be uh, carrier waves uh, in the other way of, of looking at this. So that it's fairly common in the literature right now to talk about signal transmission cortex in terms of a stack of waveforms starting very low, uh, below one hertz, then in delta waves, uh, then uh, theta, uh, uh, alpha, beta, and all the different gamma waves that don't have names yet because we've only recently discovered that they do things. Uh, so, so we have a, an extraordinary uh, symphony 
of oscillatory phenomena in cortex. Uh, cortex uh, uniquely sustains uh, this particular set of phenomena. And the, the most striking anatomical feature of cortex from this point of view is the parallel interactivity of it. So it's very much like a swarm uh, of uh, neuronal uh, circuits and networks and so on uh, that can act as a whole uh, and also any one of them can interact with all of the other ones. So I interpret all these things as being broadly consistent uh, with global workspace theory. But the whole thing evolves, of course. Uh, we know much more now about brain signaling than we did 20 years ago. Uh, so, so we keep on making new predictions, hoping that they're right and revising them if they're not. Uh, it's a very uh, productive uh, uh, theoretical program, I think, uh, one among several. I don't claim it's the only one. Uh, but it's, it's been fun and useful, and there are lots of people who are beginning to play with it. Thank you. So um, we're officially 15 minutes behind. We have time for a couple of questions while uh, our next speaker is getting ready. Uh, Let me yeah. stand over here. Um, I, I have um, one speculation and a comment. The speculation is regarding the waveform that you showed about the frontal posterior binding uh, in, a, in an uh, awake state, and right. it did not show up in the REM sleep. Right. Uh, here, here is my um, uh, speculation about this. In the REM sleep, you do not have control over what you are seeing and uh, experiencing. In other words, you cannot right. di uh, divide attention. And I think what you are seeing there is an attention guidance rather than consciousness. That was my first speculation. Well, there's a nice prediction that comes from that, namely that in lucid dreaming, you should be able to see that. You should be able to see it in lucid dream, and I think if you get those two populations, you may be able to see a similar type of curve on both ends. It's entirely speculative, and I, I don't want to say anything yeah, else. It, it's the, yes. the second comment I needed to make is I think you have a wonderful theory, and I think the theory is has all the... Um, it, it is, it, I hear it shows, a but coming. Well, it, it's... <laughs> it, it, anatomically and physiologically the components are necessary, but they're not sufficient, and here's why. In a brainstem stroke, where we have seen that many times, you knock out the brainstem, the reticular activating system goes, and the person uh, attains coma. That's anatomical uh, evidence. The physiological evidence is you have beautiful alpha waves in a state of alpha coma, which is thalamocortical uh, reverberation. And in this state, you also have a state of coma. And, and this is simply a comment that I think the framework is correct, but I think there is, like you said, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Thank yes, you. Yes, of course. Uh, the reticular formation, reticular activating system, uh, and the reticular nucleus of the thalamus <laughs> are, are tremendously important. They may be evolutionarily prior to the, uh, to the thalamus and the neocortex, certainly. Uh, and they're certainly involved in arousal. And as you know, uh, I mentioned that Roy John, the late Roy Jung, who uh, studied this as well, uh, showed, uh, but did not publish, that if you do graded lesions of the reticular activating system and allow the animal to recover between lesions, then you do not get uh, irreversible coma. So, uh, so it, it's a very interesting point. Very puzzling. Uh, I, I don't have a good story for the reticular activating system at all. Yes. Okay. Uh, we, we should move on. Let's thank Bernie. We should have time at the end for discussion among all three speakers. No, I have to sit up. We'll bring it back up. Okay. In case anyone hasn't noticed, there's been a worldwide uh, interest and activity in the area of brain mapping over the last few years with governments around the world uh, infusing uh, uh, resources into this effort and. Probably the world leader in this effort is our next speaker, uh, Henry Markram from uh, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, uh, EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland, and he will be speaking on the Human Brain Project. Welcome, Henry. Thank you. We do have a goal to be able to do a first draft simulation of the human brain by 2023. We have a billion euros to try to make a good go at it. Um, 
And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today, but just before I begin, I'm not going to talk about the whole Human Brain Project. It's actually got three major research areas. One is we call future neuroscience, which is the way that we envisage neuroscience going to be in the future. And the one other one is future medicine. And the other one is future computing, which is related to building neuromorphic computing um, chips. Um, the Human Brain Project, basically we could say simulating the human brain is a sort of very high level goal, but what is really behind it is an attempt to try to unify our understanding of the brain. So if you ask somebody, what does it mean to understand the brain? We will hear lots of different, um, we'll have lot, lot of different opinions about what it means to understand the brain. So. What we mean by understanding the brain is that we need to understand, get a, an integrated, multi-level understanding of the brain. We need to see how the brain operates across all levels. So in a sense, we're building a kind of computational microscope that can simultaneously look across all the levels of biology, from the genetic level all the way to the emergent behavior. Um, whether we're going to make a difference or contribution to consciousness, I don't know. I think that what we're hopeful in is that maybe we can provide a testing ground for you to test your theories of consciousness. I don't think we can do test all theories of consciousness. For example, we probably can't test Roger Penrose's theories of consciousness. But I think that we should be able to explore the neural correlates in some way. But um, what I'll try and do is to show you how we could contribute to our understanding of the organization of the brain, the biology of the brain. I'm a biologist, by the way. I'm not a computer scientist, even though this is essentially a computer science project. Um, but uh, So I'm very interested in understanding the biological organization of the brain. and how we could understand the potential neural correlates of behavior and perhaps neural correlates of more complex cognitive capabilities. Now, it's no, obviously it's not an easy task to link all the levels of biology, so I'm not making that as a simple task. I've, I'm, I'm a cellular biologist as well, molecular biologist, and one of the first things that I realized maybe over 10 years ago is we're never going to map the brain experimentally. Never. It's a very strong claim, but we're not going to map the brain experimentally. It's an illusion. And I'll give you some hint as you go through why that's never going to happen. What we're going to need to do is to develop an alternative facilitated tool to help us experimentally map the brain. We're going to need a new kind of tool. It's not a microscope. It's, it's not the kind of technology we know today. We think of it as developing or using data-driven algorithmic reconstruction of the brain. And I'll try and explain what that is by giving you an example of what we've done to reverse engineer or map a small piece of the brain. It's a tiny piece, a pinhead. It's the neocortical microcircuitry which is what we essentially did before the human brain started in the Blue Brain Project. So I started mapping basically experimentally the piece of the neocortex about, uh, I think, 20 years ago. I always say 10 years, but it's time is going. So the <laughs> it's about 20 years ago. I started experimentally mapping the microcircuitry. Every cell recorded from it, reconstructed it, three-dimensional reconstructions, paired recordings, looking at synaptic connections, sucking out the cytoplasm, looking at the gene expression, staining it to find out the proteins that are in it, just going for it. Thousands of experiments. We have a database of over 20,000 experiments. And I very quickly realized that it is not even a scratch to the surface. You could put, take 10,000 neuroscientists and put them to task for 10 years, you're not gonna map this little piece of the brain the size of a pinhead. And I'll show you how, why uh, as we go further. 
But we do know a lot about this piece, and in this time, we have accumulated a lot of information about how it's structured. We know about lots of the different types of neurons, and it's beautiful inside there. There are lots of different types of neurons, um, and since uh, for a hundred years, anatomists have been drawing them and describing them and naming them, and uh, we could get enough samples of each of them to produce computer models of every single type of them. There are 55 types, main types. There are actually two, three other types that we know of, but they're very rare. But there are 55 types, and we have a kind of periodic table of the neurons that are in the microcircuit. We also did experiments to work out, a, get an objective definition of what we call a microcircuit. What's the minimal group of neurons that collaborate together? And I'm not going to go through that definition, but we have been able to define it in terms of the volume, and that allowed us to actually do experiments to find out what's the cell density in each of the cortical layers, how many cells there are. We've done staining for excitatory and inhibitory cells, so we know the ratio of these cells in different layers. And uh, we've been able to find out how to position each cell depending on its morphology and branching so that it doesn't, you know, you don't have a dendrite sticking out at the top. And we've been able to use that and build software that can then call up these neurons. Uh, we uh, can clone these neurons, so we produce a database of millions, as many neurons as we need, and uh, we can then start reconstructing a piece of the brain uh, based on this uh, partial information. Now, we do step, every step that we take involves validation, checking to see whether that step matches anything we know in biology. And here is an example where we take every neuron and we see what genes are expressed in it and we use that genetic information to actually put proteins into them, model proteins, into each of the cells. And then here we stain the whole tissue as if you're an anatomist coming in and staining it for a particular protein, parvalbumin, somatostatin or whatever. And then we compare the, how the, the model tissue looks in comparison to the real tissue and we count the cells and plot them against each other. And we're able to reconstruct the circuitry with uh, an, an uh, quite a high degree of accuracy. Now, that was the cellular composition in terms of the morphologies. Cells, cell types is a very controversial issue. We're just talking about morphological types at this point in time. But let me just show you an example of the connectome. Now you've got to connect these cells. Now, if you take all these neurons, you put them in that space with all those branches, and you look and see where all the branches are touching each other, they touch each other in about 600 million locations. But that's way too many locations. If you had to form synapses at every single one of those locations, your boton density, your synapse density, would be way too high. So that's not where all the synapses are formed, but they are, it's a subset of that. And we know today from a previous study that basically there's a lot of machinery deciding where the synapses are going to form. But it's a pure accident where the location of those synapses are. In other words, the branches are crossing each other. That decides where the location is, and that's a statistical decision where the branches are. Neurons are not growing towards neurons. They're growing independently as much as possible, and it's by accident the way that they touch each other. That just determines the location where a synapse could fall. It doesn't mean there's going to be a synapse, that will determine, this whole machinery here will determine whether a synapse does form, but the location is defined by the incidental locations. So we've been able to identify four fundamental principles that we can use to now trim down from the 600 million down to about 35 million synapses that are in this part. And the first is that there's a fractional conversion. That it's, uh, we know it's not 600, it's much less. The other is that there's a rule called multi-synapse connectivity. There's no two neurons that connect by putting only one synapse. They always put a whole hand of synapses between each other. That rule is extremely important in constraining and throwing away most of those touches that there are. And then every, 
not every single hand connection, if you wish, is, is used. Part, part, about half of them are left aside so that the brain can rewire itself. We've been able to use that in an algorithm to actually, it's a three-step, quite a simple algorithm. It's got three parameters. And we've been able to use that in a three-step process to essentially reconstruct uh, the position of every single synapse. And we could validate it against every biological piece of information that there is available in the literature, from our lab, and from anywhere else. For example, here we can reproduce the number of synapses per connection between different types of cells, the number of inhibitory synapses on the cell bodies of other types of cells, the boton densities that are formed by the different types of cells, and many more. Um, so now we can actually algorithmically work out, the, derive the connectome. We don't have to measure it. We have to measure parts of it, and you will only measure parts of it, but we can algorithmically work out where every synapse is going to be on every type of cell. And when you do that, you come up and you see that there are actually 2,258 unique synaptic pathways between morphological types of cells. Later, I'll show you that there are also morphoelectrical types of cells. And if you look at that, that means there are about 31,000 unique synaptic pathways in this little piece of the brain. Bearing in mind that it's taken us 25, about 30 years to map 25 of them. <laughs> okay? So, and it costs about a million dollars to map one. It takes about a year. So it's going to take a hell of a lot to map just this piece anatomically and physiologically, let alone plasticity, molecular, and so on and so forth. So, but we can now predict them, and we can use these predictions to guide experiments and do only spot checks to check whether our principles that we use in reconstruction are correct. And then, if we find a fault, we cannot fail, because if you get a mistake, you actually under-challenge your understanding, and then you can improve your, your prediction algorithm. So you can only get better and better at predicting it, and then you need less and less experiments to be able to make further and further predictions. So now we can get a wiring diagram of this little piece of the brain, and you get the micro. You saw before a beautiful example of the whole brain connectome. You can call it that macro connectome. Um, the Allen Institute published the meso connectome, if you wish, uh, and then there's the micro connectome. And it looks pretty much, you know, also heavily interconnected. Seven million intrinsic connections between the neurons forming about 35 million synapses. Um, we can look at the difference, what's missing. Then, you know, if you look at the branches, those are all the intrinsic synapses. You can say, well, we know there should be many more, more synapses because we know what the synapse density is and so on. So we can actually calculate how much input is coming to it. And it turns out that it's about 75, almost 80% of the synapses within any piece of the brain is coming from elsewhere. It's not coming from inside. And we can determine that now for every single cell type. So we found lots of other principles of connectivity from this approach. For example, here, if you take each of your connections and you convert them into a strength in terms of how many numbers of synapses they involve, then you get a beautiful power law with an exponential of minus, exponent of minus one. And it shows that there's only about over 300 of these 2,258 pathways that are actually very strong. The rest are very, very weak. But what's interesting about it is the sum of all the strong ones is equal to the sum of all the weak ones. So do not ignore the weak ones. Together, they actually work pretty much uh, as, as strong as the, the strongest ones. It also alludes to self-similarity potential support for self-organized criticality and other phenomena. But there's also a neurosca neurosca neuron scale connectome, so you can find out all the inputs and outputs that are going to single neurons. And this now allows us, for the first time, to actually make very detailed predictions of the anatomical connections between different types of cells. So here, for example, this mimics a paper that we published in 1997 that was the first comprehensive description 
anatomical and physiological description of how two neurons are connected together. And now we can do that for the 2,258 pathways or for any of the 31,000 pathways. And when uh, we publish this paper this year, there will be a website where you can actually go and go and fly through 10,000 images that actually each one shows you the ana detailed anatomy and the physiology of these different pathways. So we're actually predicting these, these elements of biology that you can now go and challenge and say, look, I don't think that's correct. I've just seen that this is not true. Anything that you find that's not true is actually very valuable because it challenges our fundamental current understanding. So one of the things that we also found previously experimentally is that there are clusters of neurons. They cluster in a very interesting way. They follow a rule called the common neighbor rule. That means that you get dense clusters forming and they form according to how many common neighbors there are. This is very interesting because it's actually the equivalent of what's thought of as heavy in assemblies. The problem is you can predict them. You can calculate the probability of connections between neurons. There's no learning involved. These are clusters that are innate. They're coming with the territory. So you can predict that you can not only predict the connectivity between these clusters, very densely synaptic assemblies, but you can predict the synaptic weights. They saturate. So for all intents and purposes, these clusters cannot be used as Hebbian assemblies the way that people thought that they could be used as Hebbian assemblies. So we think of them as sort of innate building blocks of the circuitry. But we'll come back to that later. The point that I wanted to make is that when we put these circuits together, we discover that these clusters actually emerge from the geometry. So they're not emerging from functional rules. We're getting synaptic assemblies emerging because of the geometrical organization of the, the brain. And that little red dot is a single experimental data set that involved about 6,000 experiments to determine. And now with the, the reconstruction, we can actually make a prediction of the common neighbor bias, which determines the way that the neurons are going to cluster. We can do that for every single cell type that there is in the neocortex. There are many other predictions that we can make. For example, you can do a relational clustering, and you can find out who's the master of the universe in this circuit. And of course, it's as uh, you guys predicted, it's the layer 5 pyramidal cell. But we can now see how all the other types of neurons work and are related around it over here. And so there are many other things that we can do. Just to go on, uh, you can now do the, what every, every morphology has subtypes of electrical behaviors because they express different ion channels. And if you look at that together, there are actually 207 morphoelectrical types of neurons in the neocortex. This is, by the way, a two-week-old rat somatosensory cortex, so it's a baby. We developed a workflow that can automatically model these neurons. Uh, we push a button, essentially, and we can model millions of neurons, all the different types of neurons, automatically. It required supercomputers and lots of software. And we can recreate these neurons that they behave, essentially, as an experimentalist would find them in biology. Uh, we've done many validation tests, and we can do all kinds of indirect validation tests so that we can look at any data that's out there or any published literature that's out there and challenge these models and say, do you see that? For example, here, experiments were done by another lab that showed how the, the currents decay. We go further to simulating the synapses. We have to, of course, uh, reconstruct them, but we had to find ways to, to predict the synaptic conductances and the dynamics. Synapses have a strength based on how many receptors they have and the conductance they have, and they have a dynamics depending on how these synapses work. Um, we develop strategies how you can predict them. I won't go into that in the interest of time. We have many different ways to validate these conductances as uh, we can look at and challenge it with almost any data that's out there in the literature. We also have identified that there are six main types of dynamic synapses that there are in the neocortex. We've pulled all the literature and all the findings in many labs together to come up with a map 
that we can use to generalize and predict the dynamics in synapses that we're never going to have the opportunity to record from. And so today we can come up with a prediction of what these synapses are and then come up with a, a complete view, what we call the synaptome, uh, which is uh, you know, the, all the inputs and outputs of neurons. And if you remember, Francis Crick wrote a little piece in the Tins and uh, News and Views, I think it was, where he, he outlined six things you need to know in, if you want to understand the brain. One of them was all the inputs and outputs of every type of neuron. And that is what we can do today, is at least come up with a prediction of what are all the inputs and outputs of all the, of, of all the neurons. Um, this is just a view of what it looks like. There's actually, <laughs> it's, it's quite uh, remarkable when you actually t do look at what 35 million synapses in the size of a pinhead look like. And uh, they don't quite all look like balls. We're making them much more real, so you can get a, a deeper view. But there are many interesting features about this, of how beautifully organized the synaptic space is. There are no holes and gaps. The distributions of them are, um, are well structured. So we have now a reconstruction of the anatomy and the physiology. Uh, we had to build a lot of software to run these things on supercomputers. You need very large supercomputers to do that. You need a lot of money. and. Um, we could now begin to do some of the first simulations of what happen, What do these circuits behave. This is actually a tissue, so it's not the column anymore. It's a slice, the way we do experiments. So we mimic the piece of slice when we cut that in, a, in the lab and we put it under the microscope. We mimic that and we can start looking at activity. And I'm going to come back to that later. I just want to go forward as to what we learned and understood from this kind of activity. But um, this, is of this is the neocortical column sort of in isolation. Um, and then you can take it further. In the, in the P14 or the two-week-old rat, there are very few, there are a lot of axons going to connect them in a brain region, but they're still immature. So they're not forming clustered connectivity between microcircuits, what we, forming what we call a mesocircuit. So we can already start looking at what would happen if you connect these microcircuits and you start seeing lots of interesting things. But as I'll show you later, what you're seeing here is one point in a space of possibilities, which at that time we didn't know. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain what, I, what that means later. Um, to take that further, we built an application that can essentially read in a whole stack of scanned images from the Allen Institute of Nissel staining or any other kind of staining. And on the side here, this is a model reconstruction of neurons where we define neurons, cell densities of neurons, and then we can break them up into neurons versus glia, and every neuron you can break up into excitatory and inhibitory, and every excitatory you can break up into every cell type, and gradually you can start defining and specifying every cell type in every brain region. And since you don't know every brain region, you invite the whole world to come and do it, which is what we're doing in the Human Brain Project. We're basically saying it's impossible to understand the brain by yourself, so you have to all work together. Um, so we, we can now and integrate here as well, for example, the connectome, the, the mesoconnectome that the Allen Institute published. It's over thousands of track tracing experiments. We've been able to integrate that to define the connectivity between these neurons and start preparing for large-scale whole brain simulations. We're going to synthesize all of these neurons. We've developed computational strategies to to reconstruct their morphologies locally, meso, which is within a brain region, macro, which is the projections between brain regions, and that would allow you to actually systematically begin reconstructing this. In the Human Brain Project, we're going to focus for the first five years on the mouse brain practicing, because that's where we can get multi-level data, that's where we can build the software that will deal with all the levels of data, it's not about the mouse explaining everything. It's about the mouse giving us a testing um, a data set. Um, and then we're building the software to create a, a, a virtual an output so we can explore the behavior. So virtual avatars, virtual environments, 
The goal is to create these closed loop environments where you can actually attach a brain model to a virtual mouse and let it run around in a virtual environment and do the water maze or the uh, a maze experiment. And um, ultimately, giving us a computational framework that where we can integrate all our data and knowledge at each of these levels and start to see how the brain would function across all the levels simultaneously. Of course, to do this for the human brain, you're going to need very, very large exascale supercomputers. They're going to cost at least a half a billion dollars. And they're going to cost, every experiment's going to cost a fortune. But this, this uh, kind of strategy is what we're pushing for. Um, now I just want to quickly tell you about some interesting insight that we've had. So we wanted to do experiments on this piece of the, the circuit and to ask how does it, what, what kind of states does it go into? How does it behave? It's not about explaining the, how the brain works. We're not at the brain level, we're at the tissue level, okay? So we want to understand how does this piece of tissue work, at least some of its fundamental principles. And the first thing you have to do is to say, well, what conditions should I put the tissue in? Now if you go to the lab, you, you, you have a, you know, a solution that you put the tissue in, and the solution has high calcium or a certain amount of potassium. And so you have to mimic this environment. But you want to mimic other environments as well, like in vivo, the calcium level is much lower than in, in vitro. We normally use about two millimolar calcium. In vivo, the calcium can go down to one millimolar. And so we had to, to mimic that, you have to say, Okay, in the, under these different conditions, how, how would the neurons react and how would the synapses react? And you actually have to sort of decompose the conditions and translate that into effect on all the neurons. And we did that for the synapses first, and it's a very interesting, um, I know that this slide's a little bit technical, but basically what it means is that the excitatory and inhibitory synapses have a different sensitivity to calcium. The inhibitory synapses are much less sensitive. Don't worry. What that actually translates into is that if you go towards in vivo conditions, your inhibition gets much stronger than your excitation. And the result of it is that you completely slide away from a slow oscillatory behavior into a very asynchronous type of behavior. So there's actually a whole spectrum of states that the circuit lives in from full synchrony to asynchrony. And you can slide along that, that by moving calcium. Now, even in sleep, calcium levels are changing. But it's not the only way that you can slide along the spectrum, as I'll show you in a moment. We discovered this through simulation. And then we went back to the lab, and we actually started playing with the calcium levels. And re we could actually see the same phenomena in experiments. So we could validate that. And that was simulation-driven or guided experiments. The, what is interesting is that under these, this, in this spectrum, under the conditions of high synchrony, the spread of activity is, is extensive. So if you stimulate the brain when there are slow waves or slow oscillations, any stimulation spreads. If it is in the asynchronous state, it's very localized. So the archi functional architectures of high fidelity architectures as, t as opposed to sort of blurry low fidelity architectures when you're in, in the synchronous state. If you manipulate the neurons, you can block the neurons or synapses or different layers and you can actually slide the network along the synchrony asynchrony spectrum. But what is interesting is that we wanted to look at these clusters that I showed you before. What happens to them if you slide them along the spectrum? And it turns out that these clusters die. They form, uh, assemble. If you move it to the, the, the synchrony side of the spectrum, you're actually forming clusters of neurons. And if you slide it to the asynchrony side, you're destroying clusters. It's the, uh, the game is which cluster will survive. And those are the clusters that are coding very high frequency, very high oscillatory type of information. But this is a very messy definition of a cluster of neurons. And what we've recently done is work with some 
very theoretical mathematicians, took years to understand each other, and eventually we've come up with an incredible mathematical description, and unfortunately I can't tell you all about it, but a, a mathematical description of how neurons are connected to each other. And what we discovered when we applied this mathematical principle is that there are specific types of geometri geometrical structures in terms of which neurons, how neurons are connected to each other. And there are many different types of clusters, mathematical clusters, at different parts of the spectrum. In fact, there are millions of them. And at the synchrony side of the spectrum, you have almost the full diversity of possible mathematical structures. And when you slide it to the asynchrony side, they die, and you're left ultimately with one. There's one mathematical object that remains, that survives this shift to the asynchrony side. This is just an example of some of the some of the objects that are there, each of these is going to give different examples of the neurons involved in this mathematical structure. So, in summary, what we see the network is, the, a piece of the circuit, is that it lives on a synchrony asynchrony spectrum. You can shift along it with neuromodulation, acetylcholine, serotonin, noradrenaline, dopamine, these things shift you along this spectrum. Where you are on the spectrum determines the, rea the reaction rate, it determines the spread of activity, it determines the, uh, the frequency of the oscillations that you're going to see. But the computation is not about only there, the computation is about sliding to a different part of the spectrum where different clusters are going to form. Most of the top part that you see here doesn't depend very much on the way we built the circuit. Even if you've got lots of mistakes in the circuit, you'll see that. You'll see it in all your neural networks that you build too. If you differentially change the excitatory inhibitory balance as you do it, you'll see this shift in your neural networks as well. But depending on the composition of neurons, the types of synapses, very specific clusters are going to form. And the essence of that, there's going to be one cluster of neurons. And we think that this one cluster of neurons is what ultimately survives in a computation. And if I had to take, had to have a gun to my head and speculate about what it would look like in the whole brain, and is that there probably is a few million cells in the brain that lie at the absolute root of the entire connectivity. It's like the foundation of all other neurons the foundation of where everything is built on, and it's where everything feeds into. And it's that set of neurons that actually one needs to be able to find. And the problem is, when we first found these, I got so excited I wanted to run to the lab and record from these, find these neurons, and the mathematicians laughed, you know, they said, okay, let's do a calculation. And it turns out that to find these clusters that we, had, we found in the reconstruction, the chance is essentially zero. The probability is zero. It's one in a trillion to find some of these clusters experimentally. So you can only find them either if you record it from every neuron in the brain, or if you did a reconstruction of the whole brain and then identified them and then maybe get their molecular signatures, and then you would speak to Carl to help you identify them, and he's going to show us how he does that. And then maybe you can lesion them and see how they are potentially related to consciousness. So with that, I'd li just like to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Henry. Uh, Dave has a question, but are those uh, the ultimate neurons you're looking for? Are they how do they relate to the pyramidal cells you mentioned earlier? Well, the the pyramidal cells are definitely part of them. Yes. <laughs> Hello. Does it work? Uh, yeah. Yep. Um, I'm wondering how you know when you've 
modeled the key features of the brain that are responsible for behavior, cognition, consciousness. Um, let's make it easy. Forget consciousness. Good. Forget cognition. Let's okay. just uh, get it down to uh, behavior. I take it it's at least possible that you could model you know, thousands of features of neural systems and produce you know, really cool simulations of them in many respects while still completely missing the key features which are actually responsible for generating behavior in the crowd. That's at least a logical possibility. And you know, it's, so, it's, it's so possible that one could you know, simulate so whole local areas about that. So the one test, the one thing that would seem to be a convincing validation that you'd gotten there would be some kind of whole organism modeling where you came up with a whole organism simulation that produces what we recognize as intelligent behavior in an environment. That's also a very high bar to yeah. meet because that would require solving the so whole problem of artificial intelligence. What, I mean, where is that on your timeline? And if, if it's something short of that, what is the kind of test we can do that's going to answer that question? So one thing that I think is, is really important and has been very difficult to communicate since the beginning of this project is that the way that we're building these models is fundamentally different to the way that we've ever built models before. The, the one thing we absolutely do not do is try and model a feature. Okay? It's not a target function. In fact, it's prohibited to have a target of saying this circuit needs to do X, Y, and Z. It should have this oscillatory frequency. And so I fix my parameters to do that. So by pr in fact, it is the formula to do biological reconstruction. What we do is essentially you think of the comp a complex system as a compound model composed of many component models or embedded component models. The one thing you can't do is use the phenomena in a compound model to guide how you parameterize the component model. So we build bottom up. And so it's not about trying to capture features. It is about saying we give you the full biological description organizationally and then we attach it in a virtual body, in a virtual environment, with the learning and with all the other things. And it is a snapshot at a moment in time, right? This is a snapshot model. This is not a developmental model. It's a snapshot. And then it should be able to start learning. And we already know it can, they can start learning and they can start adapting and doing very, very interesting tasks. So it's not so much about us saying, we want this model to perform this kind of feature analysis. That's what the neuromorphic guys are doing, and they're going to build all kinds of interesting chips with it. But in order to explore the emergence of behavior, we do in silico behavior tests. And it w whatever test you do, you check to see whether the, the brain body closed loop environment can actually train, and they can learn to do it. To make the, uh, the explanatory connection even to behavior Convincingly, it, I mean, from my perspective, it looks like you pretty well have to solve the whole problem of artificial intelligence to generate the... Uh, I, no, no, it's, I really don't think it's got anything to do with artificial intelligence. This is, it's a multi-level reconstruction. If I, if I give you a theoretical model that does a, a, an amazing task, okay, it doesn't mean that you can tell me how the molecules or the cells or the synapses work to produce that task. Okay, but in this reconstruction, you get the, all the levels connected. If that model ever would perform an amazing behavior and recognize, the moment it makes a decision, you can track back the causal chain of events down to the biological machinery. That's what we mean by a computational microscope. That's what we, is missing. We don't have that kind of microscope today. And it's very different from artificial intelligence, which will give you a very deep understanding of the, some kind of principle, but not of the mechanism. Let's take one more question over. Can Actually, I have um, a follow-up question in that direction. So I presume you are modeling both the developmental pattern as well as the activity-dependent modifications. So can you simulate... No, there's no, no assumption of a developmental. These are snapshot models. What we're trying to say is that once you've done this, development will be easy because essentially you can, it's very generic, it's a generic approach, which means you can take, take an aging animal, you take the cell densities, the morphologies, the genetics, you take all that data, 
and you use that as constraints and you reconstruct a brain model at that point in time and then you run training and learning so with those capabilities. So in can fact. you, have you simulated the Torsten Wiesel Hubel ocular dominance, for example? Uh, that that will emerge. Case. We're not going to try and do it, it will emerge. And, and do you also model in astrocytes, or is it essentially yes, all Yes, we're adding the, we're doing synchrotron scanning of the whole brain, getting the whole microvasculature, glia reconstructions, putting in the glia, molecular modeling. There's a lot of things that I couldn't cover. Thank well, you. Well, I have to say, I think you deserve the billion euros. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Let's thank Henry for an amazing presentation. And, uh, so uh, our, our next speaker, while well, he's uh, plugging in his computer, a few years ago, uh, Christoph Koch uh, mentioned to me and, and others that uh, there was this guy at Stanford that had this amazing technique that was going to revolutionize neuroscience. And he did. And uh, he also has another technology that is revolutionizing neuroscience, that, and he's going to tell us about both of them. Uh, he is Carl Dyseroth from the bio Bioengineering uh, Department at Stanford University, speaking on optical density of fully assembled biological systems. Carl, welcome. All right. Thank you. So uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to be here, and this session is, uh, is really a, a nice complimentary mix of talks. Uh, it's nice to follow those first uh, two speakers, and you'll see how different, but also how uh, potentially synergistic uh, the different approaches might be. I, uh, I'm a psychiatrist. I, I treat patients who, who suffer from depression and from autism spectrum disease, uh, but most of the time I spend in the bioengineering department at Stanford where we work on building uh, technologies to study the brain in its intact state. We want very high resolution, but we want uh, to maintain the brain in its fully assembled state, uh, ideally even in the context of complex behaviors, and I'll show you examples of that. There are two uh, 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 main types of experiment. Uh, you heard about that in the introduction, optogenetics and clarity, and they fit into this uh, theme of, of trying to have high resolution, maintain a global uh, reach of the experiments. And then there's this uh, third principle of integration. We uh, would like to understand the brain uh, as deeply as possible. We'd like to understand the components and how they're wired together, but we'd also like to know the nature of those components, just as in looking at a circuit, you'd like to understand the uh, resistance, the capacitance of the different components that are present there. And we'd also like to see how those activity patterns are used, how those components are active during behavior. And we'd also like to know which of those activity patterns are causal in behavior, which actually are not just happening, but that actually matter uh, for the behavior. And each of these is hard, and we want to do them all at once, all in the same preparation at the same time. And the reason this is important is that uh, vertebrate brains are, uh, as you know, uh, very idiosyncratic. You can't look at the wiring in one brain and the activity pattern in another brain and, and try to overlay those data sets. It just won't work. So our goal is, is, is to do this, uh, and we use light to, to approach this goal. And you'll see how we're, all four of these elements are now uh, uh, coming together in single integrated systems that are uh, linkable to behavioral studies. So I'll talk about two things, the control aspect and the observational aspect. And I'll start with the observational aspect. This is a mouse brain. Uh, it's intact. It has not been sectioned, sliced, reconstructed. It's about uh, six millimeters deep, about nine millimeters long, about five millimeters wide. And the stain that you see here, it's yellow fluorescent protein that's expressed in long-range projection neurons, including the layer five projection neurons that you've heard about already today. And you can see the individual neurons, uh, and you can see there uh, dendrites, the apical dendrites going up to the surface of cortex. You can see the subcortical structures. And this is a, not a, a simulation, not a reconstruction. It actually is the brain. And this is uh, visualizable this way with the technique that we call clarity. I'll tell you a little bit about the underlying chemistry, but not too much. But it is sort of interesting. So I think it's an important thing to mention briefly. 
So the goal is to make the brain transparent. Why is it not transparent? Well, it's the lipid aqueous interfaces that scatter light. And this is a fundamental problem. Animals that have become nearly completely transparent cannot make their brain transparent. There's a, a fish, an uh, ice fish, that uh, lives near Antarctica that has become almost completely transparent. It's gone so far as to do away with red blood cells entirely. It's the only vertebrate to have done that uh, in, in its goal to achieve transparency. And yet, the brain is still completely opaque. And so that gives you a, an indication of how fundamental this issue is. Of course, neurons need lipid aqueous interfaces. That's the uh, essence of how neural uh, signaling and information processing happen. But what we can do is remove the lipids. That was the goal uh, uh, that we set for ourselves without destroying the brain, and we can make it transparent uh, in that way. It will no longer be alive, but we can do experiments in that live brain, and then we can make it transparent, and then we can register the data sets. And uh, as, as I'll show you, we can uh, do that now. So we want to remove all the lipids, but that would destroy the brain. Uh, the brain is, uh, of course, it has many membrane proteins, and uh, synapses depend heavily upon membranes. So before we get to that, we have to build in an infrastructure in place to, to retain all the biomolecules in their uh, native positions at the fine and ultrastructural level. And we do that by building a hydrogel in place throughout the brain all at once. And this is a three-dimensional scaffold of interconnected uh, 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 monomer elements that creates a, a polymer, uh, a hydrogel. And you can use different kinds of hydrogels. We use acrylamide monomers, for example. The chemistry is pretty straightforward, but you end up with each biomolecule, like a protein, being fixed in place by this hydrogel uh, uh, scaffold. At that point, the structure becomes very robust. It's, uh, it's like a very firm jello, but much stronger than it actually was before. You can uh, very vigorously remove all the lipids, very strong detergents. You can even force them out with electric fields and you end up with a brain that's completely transparent but intact and all the biomolecules fixed in place where they initially were. Uh, this is an example of the sort of thing that results. This is, again, not a simulation, uh, not a reconstruction. Uh, this actually is the brain of a mouse, uh, and you can fly around in it and see uh, the different elements, their spatial relationships, assess the uh, interconnection, interconnected uh, properties, the joint statistics that relate how different elements relate to each other. This is the hippocampus. We're flying over the CA1 layer, level, uh, layer of the hippocampus and now looking up toward cortex. These are the layer 5 projection neurons, uh, apical dendrites going up toward the surface. Uh, here's the peel surface. And you can follow uh, uh, connections and projections uh, over long distances, and you never have to take the brain apart. Moreover, it's not just seeing the wiring. Uh, an important uh, side effect of getting the lipids out is you can now do uh, molecular phenotyping. So the lipids are gone. The brain, which looks like this beforehand, looks like this afterward. You can read text through it. There actually is a, a brain there. So not only transparent, though, but you can actually stain. You can label. You can use antibodies and DNA probes. And this is an intact mouse hippocampus where we've introduced now uh, these macromolecular labels to effectively paint the different kinds of uh, molecular uh, 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 cell types that are, are present. Advantage of the clarity method is you can stain and restain multiple times. You can wash out the past label, add a new one, and so you can deliver very rich molecular phenotyping of your, uh, your real wiring diagram. That's protein labeling. You can also do staining for nucleic acids, and that lets you get to the transcriptome, which is another deeper way of understanding the molecular phenotype of the cell. Now, this uh, is... Uh, something that, that we and now many other groups are using, uh, one question you might ask is, what's the resolution? What, how, what can you see? And the answer is you can see anything that light microscopy allows you to see. Uh, so this is using a dense uh, microtubule-associated protein, MAP2, and dense neuropil. And if you image at high resolution in uh, clarified tissue, as we say, you can see there's an extremely dense uh, label. But if you uh, have imaged with a, a confocal microscope that's, uh, and using an objective that's of high quality, uh, high numerical aperture, all the information is there. And again, this is not a reconstruction or simulation. Every dendrite that's there actually is there, and the branch is where you see it. And, and that's how that particular brain uh, was, was built. And you can follow all the branches and see the relationships. And this is an antibody stain, so not requiring a pre-existing label of some kind. Uh, we've put online a lot of resources to help people do this, and other papers are starting to come out. A nice paper from Thomas Hochfeld's lab just came out in PNAS using Clarity in the spinal cord, uh, and we're running little training workshops to help people out. 
Uh, one thing we're doing is working on ways to greatly accelerate the uh, process of getting information out. Uh, you can do regular confocal microscopy. Um, that has the disadvantage of illuminating all the tissue while you scan uh, uh, your imaging uh, pinhole to create high resolution images. We think light sheet microscopy is even better. There you scan a plane of light through your tissue. And so you don't create a bleaching problem where you're not illuminating, and it's much faster. You're scanning a plane through the tissue. And we've built a next generation combination light sheet and clarity setups in a, a sort of a three dimensional volume that took a whole day to image. Uh, we now can do in two minutes. This is a two minute light sheet image, and you can see very high resolution uh, neurons and, and, and processes. And then you can stain whole brain as well. We've done whole brain staining after uh, whole brain imaging after whole brain staining for uh, neurotransmitter phenotypes. On the left is tyrosine hydroxylase, which labels, uh, for example, in the VTA neurons that are dopaminergic. And then we've done whole brain parvalbumin staining as well. Uh, these are very interesting and important uh, inhibitory neurons. And the idea is you can do then multiple rounds of staining and come to a deep uh, uh, molecular phenotyping of your intact brain. Now that's a largely mouse brain uh, uh, work that I've shown you. Uh, this is a human brain in the lab, and we have uh, uh, a number of these now that uh, have been donated. These are, many of them are very precious samples, and uh, we want to get as much information out of them as we can. Uh, but a lot of these, uh, you might ask, are they going to be suitable for clarity? They've been sitting in you know, formalin for, for years in, in brain banks. And as it turns out, it's no problem. You can actually do clarity perfectly well in these uh, uh, brain bank samples. And you can even stain for things. We've taken uh, these human brains um, and some from disease cases, autism, for example, and some from uh, 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 typical humans. And you can stain here for uh, neurofilaments, tracing axons over long distances. This, by the way, is a blood vessel that's going through this uh, region of uh, brain area 10 of cortex. So we can do uh, a human work too, and just to wrap up this part before I go on to the optogenetic side, it's actually kind of interesting that you can build an infrastructure from uh, within a brain everywhere. And the, the hydrogel, that's the essence of clarity, is uh, pretty remarkable, but also pretty simple. It's a, a simple, passive, uh, hydrophilic, uh, three-dimensional scaffold. But there are many other kinds of gels and structures and scaffolds you could build now, knowing that this sort of thing is possible. You could have conducting polymers to allow you to, to actually interact more deeply with the, 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 the tissue. You could have uh, functionalized uh, uh, side groups that allow you to uh, attach things at particular points. The fact that you can get antibodies through means you could get uh, other uh, proteins like enzymes through, and we're working on this uh, to actually get uh, uh, transcriptomic uh, uh, information about the individual cells in situ, where they should be wired up and uh, uh, connected as they should be to know what genes they're expressing, you could do, use things like uh, 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 RNA-seq, uh, which is a high content way of identifying the transcriptome uh, using polymerases, which can be uh, introduced uh, into the intact tissue. So a lot of uh, uh, room to grow. It's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, paradigm, which I think we've just begun to, to scratch the surface of. The other thing I wanted to share with you is uh, advances on the optogenetic uh, control side. And this is, uh, also uses light, and also uses the intact system, uh, but it's uh, more a way of delivering uh, a perturbation, a causal uh, element of control that helps you understand not just what's happening, but, but is, it, is it important? Is it actually important for behavior? And you know, you can put in electrodes, of course, which work very well. They're fast. You can introduce an electrode and stimulate uh, in a region that's defined locally, but you can't discriminate individual kinds of cells that are nearby. Uh, this is a fundamental issue. The electrode cannot uh, determine that it's one cell type or another, nor e even in this location need it be stimulating cells that reside in that region or have any particular functional significance to that region of the brain. There could be axons passing through that region coming from one part of the brain to another. So uh, what we've sought to do is develop uh, what we call optogenetic excitation. And the way we do this is we introduce, uh, uh, using various genetic tricks and viruses, uh, light-activated ion channels and pumps. These are amazing proteins, most of which we get from microbial organisms like this single-celled green algae, Chlamydomonas reinhardii. It has flagella that it uses to, to locomote through uh, water to find the ideal light level to photosynthesize uh, uh, for, for energy. And it uses this blue light activated regulator of cation conductance called channel rhodopsin. 
And what we found back in uh, 2004 and 2005 was that we could introduce this into neurons and deliver blue light pulses, and the neuron would follow those uh, blue light pulses with action potentials. And we could do the same light pulse to a different neuron and get almost exactly the same uh, light pulse train, uh, out, action potential train out. So this is causal control of neural coding uh, in response to delivery of a single gene, a single gene that encompasses light responsivity and ion flow all within a single uh, open reading frame. And that single component nature was crucial for getting it to work, to be, make it be targetable, to be applicable to freely moving mammals. In 2007, we were able to actually take this experiment, which was in the dish, and move it into a freely behaving mammal, even targeting a very deep brain structure. We used fiber optics to get the light in deep because, of course, the light uh, would scatter otherwise uh, if it were delivered from the surface of the brain. And we were able to play in particular patterns of activity into a targeted uh, population of cells uh, called the hypercretin neurons using uh, what's called a promoter, a promoter fragment that governed expression of the channel rhodopsin only in the targeted cell type, which is the hypercretin neuron in this case. And we played in different spike patterns into those targeted cell types and found that some patterns but not others could control behavior. Uh, and we, in particular, we were looking at the behavioral state transition of awakening. In 2012, we started to get more into uh, uh, complex motivational behaviors, looking at reward, looking at depression, looking at anxiety-related behaviors, and very recently we've gotten into social behavior, and that's what I wanted to spend uh, uh, the rest of the time on. But uh, what's interesting is we've also made a lot of headway on the structure of these proteins, and we've engineered them using molecular tools to create a huge diversity. We can now have, we can turn on, we can turn off. We can use different time scales. Uh, we can um, make different uh, colors of light, the, uh, the spectrum that's the, the, the optimum for control of the tools. And all of this, you know, all this we call optogenetics, and I always like to highlight how important uh, some of the very early foundational work uh, just in studying these organisms was. And so people have studied algae and archaebacteria, where many of these come from, for, for decades. Uh, and this is very fundamental work. The people who did this work had no thought about neuroscience or certainly psychiatry, but were just studying these cool organisms for their own sake. And, and this uh, sort of thing was, of course, uh, essential for us to, to, to create this uh, uh, optogenetic approach. And that's allowed us to discover uh, the causal cellular activity patterns, and we look at both normal function and in disease models. So I want to share a study that's, uh, that's uh, in press uh, at Cell, and it, it involves optogenetic techniques in the study of social behavior. And it involves a delivery of light through a fiber optic, but it has a new twist. It also collects light through the same uh, kind of fiber. Uh, and we call that fiber photometry. And that lets us not only control a particular pathway or projection, but detect what's normally going on, how the animal normally uses that very same projection in the course of complex behaviors. And it looks a little similar to what you might imagine that initial uh, sleep hypocretin experiment optogenetic uh, setup might be. There's a fiber optic that's implanted into the brain of the animal, uh, and there's a laser that controls the light coming in to detect the native activity, we use what's called a genetically encoded calcium indicator. Calcium goes up when neurons are active, and there are proteins, genetically encoded proteins, that you can put in that change their fluorescence when calcium goes up. Okay. It's a small signal, uh, but we can pick it up. We have some tricks. We use an, a fast spinning pinwheel called an optical chopper and a lock-in amplifier that picks up the signal at just the right time. That greatly improves the signal to noise. And so we can use this fiber optic for listening or observing, let's say, rather than just controlling. We can do both. So we use a, a virus. We introduce it into a targeted cell population. One of the ones that we were most interested in was the dopamine neurons in the ventral tegmental area, which uh, control reward but control motivation, uh, control movement. They, these dopamine neurons have projections through uh, most of the brain, including the prefrontal cortex to accumbens. And we were interested in studying them to see if they had a causal role in modulating social behavior. So uh, knowing they were also important in reward, though, we th thought, well, let's give the animal something that we know it likes. Let's give it some sugar. So that's what we did first to validate the setup. We gave the animal an opportunity to lick some sugar water to do so a sucrose consumption task. 
And so we have the genetically encoded calcium indicator that we put into a virus. We injected that into the ventral tegmental area, and it's in dopamine neurons in that region because of an additional genetic trick. There's a tyrosine hydroxylase uh, mouse line that expresses a DNA recombinase called Cree, and our virus that we introduce in is Cree dependent. It only expresses in cells that make Cree and therefore are tyrosine hydroxylase cells, i.e. dopamine cells in the ventral tegmental area. Probably more than you wanted to know, but that's how you get the dopamine neuron specificity. Okay, so what happens then? You've got this freely moving animal. It's able to lick sugar water or not whenever it wants. And what do you see? Well, if you just express a yellow fluorescent protein, uh, you don't see anything. Each of these red dashes is when the animal is actively licking at the sucrose uh, port. And that's good. We don't expect yellow fluorescent protein to be reporting on activity. But in, in separate mice, if you have introduced this genetically encoded calcium indicator that we call GCAMP, uh, you see something very different. Every time the animal licks, you see this uh, burst of GCAMP signal in the dopamine neurons in the ventral tegmental area, okay? So this is really interesting. We're actually seeing, we're seeing these particular genetically defined cell types responding as the animal is executing uh, a behavior that it naturally would, and it's experiencing whatever it is experiencing in real time. Okay, so that was just sucrose consumption, though. We wanted to study something a little more complicated. And we had an, another stream of uh, work in the lab that uh, was looking at social behavior, and, and I'm interested in that from the autism perspective. It's a very highly integrative uh, behavior. It involves, uh, as you might imagine, consciousness on many levels, and this was one of the reasons that we sought to study it, but trying to find a tractable uh, a foothold, experimental causal foothold in, in, into this uh, uh, realm. And so we did some optogenetic control experiments first. We did a very similar experiment to what I just showed you, except instead of observing, we were controlling. We were playing in light and delivering optogenetic control. And what happens if you turn up or down these dopamine neurons in the ventral tegmental area optogenetically in real time as the animal has a choice of behaving socially or not. It was an open question, hadn't been tested. And what we found was that if you turn up the activity of these neurons using a channel rhodopsin, an excitatory optogenetic tool, you get an increase in social interaction. But if you turn down those neurons using an inhibitory optogenetic tool, this is a halo rhodopsin, HR, you see a decrease in social interaction. Okay, we can turn up or down these neurons in real time as the animal behaves, and we see increased sociability. This is same sex, conspecific, uh, same species, social interaction. The animal has a choice of interacting or not. If you turn up these neurons, it just chooses to interact more with the other animal. If you turn them down, it chooses to do that less. What was interesting is this effect was not seen with just an object. If you put in a novel object, a golf ball, uh, something like that, that's not affected. So this, this principle uh, was, seemed to be at least uh, partially specific to a social interaction, and it didn't affect things like locomotion or, or general movement. Okay, so that's interesting. That's the control side, so we're, maybe we're on the right track. Now let's observe. Let's use the fiber photometry, and let's see what those cells are normally doing. Because, you know, we can play in activity, but we don't know that's what uh, is normally going on. So now switching to observation mode, we see some very interesting things. So this is social interaction instead of sucrose consumption. But again, you see, although it's not quite as time-locked, and that's probably because social interaction is much more complex temporally than simply looking at a port and getting a, a jolt of sucrose. There's an approach, an interaction, a withdrawal, but still uh, pronounced elevations in these neurons as the animal's engaged in, in social interaction. Uh, but what was confusing to us was this. Uh, you also saw that with a novel object. So you saw elevations in the activity of these cells, of these dopamine cells, in response to an object. And that seemed a little bit at odds with the fact that when you turn up or down these cells, optogenetically, you're not affecting a novel object interaction. So we were a little confused by that, and we thought maybe we're not looking quite at the right signal we need to fully understand the social uh, behavior. Now, one interesting thing is we were looking at all the ventral tegmental area dopamine cells at once. And maybe one question was maybe we're not looking at quite the right subpopulation. Okay, and so maybe we need to be more refined in our experiments. And we had some ideas. Maybe we could just look at the ventral tegmental area dopamine cells that project to prefrontal cortex. Maybe those would be the right population. And that was my first guess. We've done a lot of work in my own lab with optogenetic manipulation of prefrontal cortex and social behavior and had seen interesting things. This is an experiment 
uh, back from 2011 where we modulated excitation inhibition balance in prefrontal cortex. And we, when you elevate excitation inhibition balance, you profoundly disrupt social exploration, the same kind of same-sex conspecific social exploration. And this was interesting. It had been a hypothesis in the autism field that elevated excitation inhibition balance, which is seen in various ways in autism, might be causal in social behavior disruption, but nobody had a way of causally testing that physiology. We went into mice. We did that. We boosted optogenetically the excitability of excitatory cells over inhibitory cells, and we indeed saw disruptions in social behavior and pronounced gamma oscillations, which are also seen at baseline to be elevated in autism. Here's an example of that. This is a, a frequency uh, spectrum, and this range, the high gamma range between 60 and 120, when we flip on our optogenetic intervention, we see this high gamma activity. When we turn it off, that disappears. You can see that high gamma activity here, and it's under those conditions where you see this disrupted social behavior. All this was done in prefrontal cortex. So this was back in 2011, but that made us think prefrontal cortex, for a lot of reasons, it's a highly integrative uh, region. It involves uh, uh, executive function uh, and could be involved in this uh, sort of social behavior. Maybe that's the kind of population of dopamine neuron that we need to look at projecting to prefrontal. And indeed, even in mouse, there are robust projections from VTA to prefrontal cortex. Uh, if you do some staining in prefrontal cortex, this is the prelimbic and infralimbic regions, you can see many uh, neurons. All neurons are labeled with green just for the nuclei, but red fibers are tyrosine hydroxylase fibers, and you can see many neurons that are heavily invested by uh, these uh, uh, TH or tyrosine hydroxylase fibers. So then the question became, how do we recruit a selective uh, projection? How do you get just the VTA cells that project to the prefrontal cortex? And here we use a, a optogenetic principle that we call projection targeting. The simplest optogenetic experiment is when you target a subset of cells uh, in the brain uh, genetically, and then you bring in a fiber optic, and you deliver light and control those cells. There's a twist on that that's projection targeting, where you bring in your fiber optic and you put it in the wrong place. You put it in a different region that was not transduced. That is what we call projection targeting, because all the cells that live here and send their projections here will be recruited because of their connectivity. The opsin gets shipped down the axon, and you can actually turn cells on or turn that projection off by illuminating in that downstream region. And so it's a nice trick. You don't need to know the genetics of the cell type. You just need to know uh, your anatomy. So that could be something we could do. We might imagine transducing the ventral tegmental area and then illuminating in prefrontal cortex or other candidate regions. And so that's what we did. Uh, by the way, we, uh, this is a, a recent review, but many groups uh, have now used this projection targeting approach. Uh, we put this out in 2011 in an anxiety model, and since then many other people have used projection targeting and behavior uh, to assess complex behavioral phenotypes using optogenetics. So we had high, uh, you know, uh, confidence that something like this might work. So we went ahead and, and, and started to explore the VTA to prefrontal cortex projection. And just as a sanity check, uh, we said, well, uh, if you drive ventral tegmental area dopamine neurons hard, do you see responses in other brain regions, including prefrontal cortex? And we, can, we did that optogenetically, and we said, okay, we did both recordings, and we stained for immediate early gene products like CFOS. And if you do that, you can see certainly pronounced elevations in activity in prefrontal cortex. But you see it in other regions, too, into the nucleus accumbens, a brain area heavily involved in reward processing, but less so in other regions, the basolateral amygdala, uh, less so. So there was some complexity, but uh, uh, still, we went ahead and tried the prefrontal cortex projection targeting experiment. We transduced the ventral tegmental area dopamine neurons and illuminated in prefrontal cortex. Well, we saw a lot of things, but not a social behavior effect. Um, and what we saw was a pronounced anxiety effect. The animals really didn't like it. They don't like it if you drive the dopamine neurons that project to prefrontal cortex. This was a surprise to us. We have various ways of assessing anxiety. This is the elevated plus maze, where there's a closed arm that the animal loves to be in, the mouse likes to be in, and an open arm that it's very exposed in, uh, avoids uh, very seriously, and this is an anxiety model because it's apprehension in the absence of immediate threat, and you can quantify its preference for the open arm or the closed arm. Whenever we turned on the light, the animals completely avoided the open arm. It was, therefore, we say anxiogenic. It increased their representation of this anxiety-like behavior. And then you turn the light off, and it goes back to how it was before. 
That's if you're just driving the VTA cells. You see the same thing if you drive the projections from VTA to prefrontal uh, anxiogenic. So the animals did not like this stimulation. Uh, it was also aversive by other means. You can do something called a conditioned place preference where you simply see which uh, chamber of a uh, three-chamber apparatus the animal likes to be in. And we found they would avoid the chamber where they got the stimulation of this projection. Okay, so it was aversive and anxiogenic. They didn't like it. And there was not a social behavior uh, effect. If you drove the projection from VTA to prefrontal, it was not social, uh, socially modulatory. However, the projection to the nucleus accumbens did promote social behavior. And so we found no effect with just expressing yellow fluorescent protein, but driving the projection from VTA to, to nucleus accumbens uh, did succeed in elevating the social behavior. And this uh, was, was borne out in multiple other uh, targeting modalities. You never see an effect if you just express, express a fluorescent protein, but various other ways of targeting this projection, ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens, uh, increased uh, this uh, social behavior. By the way, if you decrease activity using this inhibitory halorodopsin pump, you see a decrease in, in the uh, social uh, interaction. Okay, so this was a clue. Maybe we could bring this back now and understand this uh, paradox. So remember, this was now this uh, puzzling thing when we were doing fiber photometry and, and observing the activity in the ventral tegmental area dopamine neurons. Uh, we were seeing the same magnitude of responses for, for both novel object and social interaction, which was strange to us because when we controlled those cells, we saw an effect on social behavior but not novel object. So the question is, well, maybe the right population to look at then is selectively image the ventral tegmental area to nucleus accumbens uh, uh, projection. And so instead of, you can think of this uh, in terms of uh, sort of a symbolic logic, instead of observing the activity of cells upstream that project to a downstream region, each of which you'd be imaging their time varying activity level, instead, what if you could actually image the projection activity in real time? And so bring in your fiber photometry, bring in your observational fiber, and put that in the downstream structure and image the activity of the projections and see how is the animal using this projection in real time? What's the traffic over this projection in real time during social behavior? And this was how, how we'd done it before. This is what we did now. And we could do this now because we now knew the right downstream structure to look in, the nucleus accumbens, and not the prefrontal cortex. And there, for the first time, we saw very pronounced differences, uh, striking effects uh, in the activity observed in the projections. So here, introducing the genetically encoded calcium indicator into the ventral tegmental area, uh, but doing the fiber photometry, observing the activity in the nucleus accumbens. And each social interaction bout was accompanied by uh, pronounced elevations. And although you're, there was still a little bit with the novel object, it was uh, much uh, reduced. And so this helped us understand that this was uh, a projection that the animal was, was using uh, uh, in, a, in a natural fashion. Uh, in the course of social interaction. And that then dovetailed well with our optogenetic control experiments. Now I'm going to show you some movies uh, to show you the social interaction. It helps to sort of bring it home. And it's pretty uh, striking to see this. What you'll see is a, a red bar that's in real time fluctuating up and down. And this is in real time how the animal is using. It's the activity in the targeted cell population or the targeted projection. And it's just sort of mesmerizing to see this happening in real time as the animal is interacting with another animal uh, to see this uh, uh, real-time readout of this targeted cell or the targeted projection. And I'll start with this. This was the, start with just imaging at the cell bodies. So just imaging in the ventral tegmental uh, area uh, cell bodies. And there's the social interaction at the top, the novel object at the bottom. I'll show you the social interaction first. Here's the red bar. Here's our animal. And here's its target. And you can see. Uh, you can track which animal we're recording from because it's got a little white cap where the fiber is implanted. And as the animals freely move, you can see uh, the uh, ventral tegmental area dopamine activity. And it is closely correlated with times in which the animals are uh, most uh, closely engaged in interaction. Uh, flank, uh, snout, and uh, uh, anogenital areas are of great interest to the mice. Um, and now, that's in contrast uh, to the behavior with the novel object, where you, this was the confusing part. We still saw these pronounced elevations, uh, and that's because we're not yet imaging the projection. And so we saw it's just a golf ball, but the animal is still having these very pronounced elevations in ventral tegmental area dopamine activity. 
that was our initial paradox that confused us, and that was because we were just imaging all the VTA dopamine cells at once. Now, what if you go ahead and do this actual uh, uh, more specific experiment of uh, observing the activity in the projection, and you look at social interaction versus novel object, and I'll play them uh, together, and you can see, um, again, in the projection, you see still pronounced elevations. Novel object, there's a little bit, uh, but much less. So it's, we're, in seeing what these uh, animals are experiencing, uh, at least in terms of their ventral tegmental area dopamine neuron projection activity in a targeted downstream region, is uh, that it's been thus far an inaccessible variable in neuroscience. It has not been possible to see the activity along a projection in uh, a behavior. And so we think and hope this might be a useful tool for a number of studies, uh, not just in, in social interaction. This is just a quantitative summary of this uh, sort of work. Uh, this is the, the lack of discrimination between the social and novel object that was seen if you just record activity at the ventral tegmental area cell bodies. The darker shades are the actual, the, the three darker shades of blue or green are the direct interaction epochs behaviorally scored of interaction approach and immediate withdrawal. Not much difference between social and novel object, but then recording activity in the projection uh, you see pronounced uh, differences. And so that helps us understand how the animal's uh, normally using uh, this uh, particular projection. There's a lot of interesting ways to go uh, after this. We think we can actually uh, uh, record activity not only in the projection, but in postsynaptic cells. And so we can infer synaptic weights in real time, or at least the average weight of a projection uh, in real time as the animal behaves and as behavioral plasticity is modulated. And that's a, a follow-up step. And this uh, sort of thing, uh, not just social behavior, but we think it could be applied uh, to a broad range of uh, complex behavioral uh, processes, including anxiety, depression, uh, and reward, and other motivational processes. So that's sort of a, uh, a couple uh, anecdotes from our work. Uh, a lot more uh, would love to share if we had more time, but the, this is the overarching goal. We uh, are, use uh, chiefly optical tools, but try to keep the system as intact as possible to control an image with high resolution uh, and to, to register the different data sets. Uh, we actually can register uh, activity data sets recorded in real time with high resolution anatomy. Uh, and in that way, we're not so hampered by the fact that clarity is conducted in uh, post-living uh, tissue. So this is our amazing team. I want to just uh, uh, thank all our collaborators, our uh, 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 websites uh, which have resources that might, people might find useful are shown here. And I just want to highlight a, a couple people who uh, uh, did the work that I focused on here. The clarity work, uh, uh, Raju Tomer led the development of the light sheet method, Kwang Hoon Chung and Viviana Gradnaru led uh, a lot of the initial uh, clarity work. Um, Kwang Hoon's now at MIT, Viviana's now uh, at Caltech. And the fiber photometry work led by Lisa Gunaiden and uh, Logan uh, Grosenek, both graduate students uh, in the lab. Um, so thanks for your time, uh, and I uh, look forward to talking more. Thank you. Let's take uh, one or two uh, for Carl and before our panel. Let me, hang on a second. Let me ask uh, one question. You, you showed the high gamma in the autistics. Is, uh, there are reports that autistic brains have too many connections. Do you have any take on that? Um, yeah, there's, you know, the histology has been a little more uh, uh, inconsistent, I think, um, you know, and even the, the gamma effect, what's pronounced is you see this elevated baseline gamma in autism, but reduced uh, task evoked gamma. The, uh, the physical connectivity, uh, you know, there have been reports that there's a, a paucity of, of connections as well. So I think the, the, the microanatomy is, is not quite there where it needs to be for us to understand in, in terms of the wiring. There are conflicting reports. But what does seem to be the case is that there may be unbalanced by whatever mechanism, whether a wiring difference, uh, synaptic or ion channel effect, that there's uh, uh, many different routes you can get to elevated excitation uh, inhibition balance. Yes. Uh, oops, sorry. You want me to stand? I guess. That's fine. I'll stand for Susan's sake. Uh, yes, you're kind of your next to last experiment where you're going to the medial prefrontal. If, if I recall, the, the infralimbic, the lower, is, is sort of equivalent to 
primate area 25? Yeah, it's probably the closest there is. That's oh, right. Okay. And that's an area, of course, in primates and humans that seems to be tied in a lot with extreme depression, and, and they will sometimes inhibit that to, to, to help a person and so on. Now, that's different from anxiety, but I'm just, I'm just curious if you're seeing some, maybe a general aversive aspect there in, in the 25 slash IL. It's actually a great question, uh, and, and so the work you're referencing, you're absolutely right. Uh, patients with depression, uh, they have elevated metabolic activity in this uh, subclosal uh, cingulate that if there is a homologous region, it's, uh, it's probably similar to the infralimbic in rodents. Uh, and, and so uh, what's interesting, Helen Mayberg and her colleagues, when they see an acute interoperative effect of their deep brain stimulation targeting the brain area 25 subclosal cingulate, they often report uh, immediate effects that are not too dissimilar from uh, anxiolytic effects uh, and also uh, relief of aversive type stimuli. The patients will report the lifting or absence, sudden absence of uh, this negative uh, 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 psychic pain that was present already. So there are certain, uh, certain similarities to the clinical situation for sure. Uh, let's, let's thank Carl for another amazing presentation. And, uh, yeah. Sit and we'll, uh, come here. Oh, yeah, sit. Stay in the chair. Uh, can we have Bernie and Henry come up, please? Is there another mic? Uh, yes. All right. Oh, Sir Rob's got you want me to take okay. it, Rob? Okay. Actually, I, I have a quick question for uh, Dr. Dizarot. So have you thought about, or do you think it will be useful to look at this in sort of Sir Rob, hang on a second. We'll get to you. Uh, let, let's start with, uh, do any of you have questions for the other speakers? I have a lot, but there's too many to, 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 uh, to spill down right now, so I'll, I'll pass. Okay, Henry? Okay, okay. Back to you, Saraf. So I was wondering, do you think it will be useful to look at um, the connections in a MECP2 sort of RET-like model or you know, FXR mice? Have you, are you doing those sort of experiments? I mean, I know this, it's, I mean, it's not quite as precise autism, it's more complicated. Can you hear me, Mr. Yeah. Maybe I could get a microphone. The question is, could we do these sorts of experiments in uh, mouse models of MECP2? That's a gene that is involved in uh, Fragile X and, and other uh, disorders. Uh, and that kind of thing is definitely on the agenda. In fact, we have uh, mouse models of certain behavioral um, uh, phenotypes that we're studying to look for strategies to correct those phenotypes using uh, optogenetics. And we can see some uh, 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 early uh, positive results already. I have a question for Dr. Markram. Um, I'm over here. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, why start with the human brain? Why not start with the brain of a bee or the brain of one of the parasites on the bee or something that we actually could possibly think of mapping within our lifetimes? Well, we're not starting with the human brain, we're starting with the rodent brain, but you could also, it's just as complex, so your question is, is equally valid. You know, I, I think that what is much more important, it's not the size, it's not the number of neurons. There are 302 neurons in C. elegans, and they know them. Uh, it's the data, accessibility to the data. So even there, in C. elegans, we don't know the synaptic connections, the synaptic behavior, where the ion channels are, the receptors are. We can, it's actually much more difficult to do a reconstruction of a very simple organism like that. And um, I think it would take equally long. So, it, and it's, I, so I don't really see a, a degree of difficulty that would justify saying, let's do it on a simple organism. Uh, rather than going directly for the mammal. In the end, a neuron is a neuron, and it's going to have a billion, billion proteins, so it's going to have 10,000 different proteins, and it's going to have millions of interactions. Whether you do that in the simplest possible organism or the most complex possible organism, the scale of the challenge is almost the same. 
where you get a, a different level of the challenge is when the connectivity emerges. But if you have the principle, it is, uh, that's actually what you have to solve anyway. And it's not how many connections there are. So I think the size and the number of neurons and the number of connections, this is not the parameter that determines whether it's easy. Uh, we, we don't yet understand this elegance, and I think it's because, from my point of view, it would be good. We don't have a real biological reconstruction of it. But I think that some people may be attempting that, and that would be good. But I think we should go straight for the human. There's no time to waste. Uh, Dr. Markram, uh, your intense world theory of autism certainly has gained probably more traction than any other theory with, uh, with autistic people. And I'm wondering whether or not the experiments that are being done with mice that show a decrease uh, in social interaction in the, <laughs> in the excitement state, whether that supports your theory. The last part? The, the, the experiments that are being done where mm -hmm. when, 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 the, the, when the mice, when the neurons were excited and there was a decrease in, in social interaction, whether or not that supports the intense world theory. I think it's difficult to say and to interpret. One of the things that we faced when we looked at, at, at autism was that it's the interpretation of fMRI data or any kind of sensory response data to what the neurons are doing, it, it, was, uh, it was a little bit biased by a kind of dogma that there was a major impairment in the brain. And, and you can interpret that data differently. Uh, there are a lot of protection mechanisms preventing certain neurons being active, certain brain regions getting active. Those protection mechanisms don't necessarily mean that there isn't a hyperreactivity. Um, our theory came just from a, a basic observation that in the circuitry there's hyperreactivity, and wherever we looked, we saw hyperreactivity and hyperplasticity. And then when we did behavioral tests, we found that there was there was uh, a, a permanent learning uh, of fear-conditioned behavior, and you could not uncondition them. So there was a resistance to, to being uh, unconditioned, or you could say rehabilitation. Uh, we've done a lot more on that, and we are doing it. And it's becoming very interesting, because we try to nail down what is the postnatal trigger or driver uh, in autism. And currently, we think that the poison is surprise. Um, and it is actually triggering the development of the circuits to actually start protecting and shutting down certain pathways. It's, you know, we started this, it's uh, a direction that it's taking. We're finding a lot of, in some supporting evidence for it. I mean, Carl mentioned that there are other uh, things that are more difficult to interpret. There's evidence that there's weaker connections in some places. But I think that in general, it looks like there is a lot of support. I know that there's Knut from Rockefeller, which is identifying genes that are uh, encoding for hyper excitability and hyper reactivity. And they're actually developing drugs that are going to try and reduce the activity of these genes, uh, potentially treating uh, autism. So the hyper reactivity or hyper functional theory of autism, I think, um, is, is an, a totally uh, unexplored area which w we really need to pay attention to. Well, uh, no. Um, look, um, it, what struck me this morning is um, uh, how, how much work you've done, amazing work to just, uh, just start to address some of the easy problems and it's made me realise just how hard the hard problems are going to be. But um, my question is actually for Dr. Deetheros. Um, it, it struck me that um, one of the limitations of your optogenetic uh, control technique is having to get the optic fibre into the relevant place. So is there any possibility of a radiogenetic technique so that you could do 
something a little bit like the inverse of MRI with radio frequencies, which wouldn't have that limitation of ha having to penetrate through translucent uh, matter. Yeah, there's uh, just to broaden your question even further, the question is what other kinds of energy delivery could you use besides light? Light scatters, but magnetic energy, uh, ultrasound, uh, radio waves, uh, uh, you know, heat, all kinds of different uh, energy delivery could be used. Uh, some of those might scatter less, but the problem with all of them is, is you have to have a, uh, an antenna on the targeted cell. Uh, if you want to do optogenetics, if you want to know what a cell or projection is doing, you need to photosensitize the targeted cell. Uh, so far, although there are various ways you can think about that for each of those energy modalities, none of them uh, actually works yet in a single component, easily targetable way. So uh, it's just not there yet uh, technically. Um, light, because it's uh, a signal so important in biology, there's been so much great evolution that we can capitalize on. And uh, that's kind of where we are right now. But we're always, always thinking about it. Ultrasound is the most focusable, isn't that right? Ultrasound is focusable. Uh, and so it's definitely interesting. You could imagine strategies for making uh, so what, uh, making vibration responsive ion channels, for example, and so that would be a, a very plausible way of doing it. Vibrations cause stretch in the membrane of neurons. There are stretch activated ion channels. You could imagine uh, uh, targeting uh, some engineered stretch activated ion channel in such a way. And, and we've thought about that, uh, uh, just not quite there yet. Don Delaney? Well, my simpler question is for Bernie. I found your representation of the change in brain imaging with automatization very revealing and useful. And I'm asking if you interpret it this way. Do you interpret it as all of those complex symbolic processes that precede the automatization, dropping out rather than dropping down, dropping down to an unconscious, so that there are then with the unconscious activity, complex, unconscious, deliberative, symbolic activity, when there might be instead just rather direct and much simpler associative activations. So I wonder, how you interpret that, and if the kind of interpretation that naturally comes to mind for me is reasonable to you. Um, I recognize your question um, from, uh, from the long history of psychology where that sort of thing was discussed, uh, as in the case of Clark Hall. Um, and uh, my, my most recent bias is to think that uh, that biology uh, likes redundancy, and so that if there are ways to represent things symbolically, as well as to represent them in terms of particular images, for example, and relationships between, inferential relationships between images, uh, that the human brain certainly um, is, is perfectly happy to waste a huge amount of computational power to get lots and lots of redundancy and extremely rich representations. What happens um, uh, during automaticity in that particular case is, is that you probably do not lose those rich representations. They're recoverable, and they're particularly recoverable if, uh, if the predictable aspects of the tasks uh, become unpredictable at some moment. Uh, so, um, so my vote would be right now uh, not in favor of sort of an Occam's razor approach, but rather in, in favor of a, um, what Edelman calls a, re a, a degeneracy approach, a, a, a massive redundancy approach uh, for the general strategy that the brain adopts. I, I have one for Dr. Markham. Uh, you mentioned the importance of geometry and synaptic clustering, and then you showed that the uh, columns have a hexagonal arrangement. Given the hexagonal repeat at different scales in entorhinal cortex, for example, uh, is there anything special about hexagonal geometry? Actually, no. Actually, no. That is, uh, it's technical. Uh, in order to tile the columns, 
we basically use a hexagonal. Okay. Because if you had to use circles, then you get into trouble. Okay. So it's more a technical thing. It doesn't mean the columns are hexagonal. Thanks. Question, questions for uh, Dr. Markham. Uh, just wondering about the number of cells that you find in these clusters. Is there like an average number that you tend to find, or is it all over the place? So in the in the common neighbor um, cluster, common neighbor driven clusters, and ac actually common neighbors are driving all the clusters. It's just the way that you would measure them. If you measure them using certain cluster algorithms, you have to put a threshold at where it starts to become, you know, very significant beyond randomness. If you do that, you get clusters of about 50 neurons. Um, but the mathematical clusters that I was talking about, they range from three to many more neurons. So there are many different kinds of clusters. Let me just say that uh, before we close that if any of you haven't had enough consciousness, uh, today is uh, the afternoon is free, but we will be having a special brain mapping symposium at the uh, University Medical Center, which is about a 15-minute walk from here, with uh, Henry Markram, Christoph Koch, and uh, Anurban Banjapati. And uh, you're all welcome. It's in the Duval Auditorium. If you just cross the campus and go to Campbell and Speedway, you'll see a big gray, uh, gray-white complex, and it's in there in, in the main, main entrance. Um, so with that, I think uh, we'll close and we'll reconvene at 11.30 and let's give our speakers a great round of applause. <laughs>